next on the Project Censored show, we continue our conversation about Julian Assange. We will welcome back author Kevin Gostola, his latest book, Guilty of Journalism, The Political Case Against Julian Assange, with a foreword by Abby Martin. In the first segment of the program today, we were honored to be joined by the father and brother of Julian Assange, uh, John and Gabe Shipton, talking about the new documentary Ithaca. And of course, we uh, this segues uh, very well into our next guest, who's certainly no stranger to the Project Censored audience, uh, independent journalist Kevin Gostola, the managing editor at Shadowproof. Um, Kevin has recently authored a book with the Censored Press and Seven Stories Press. It'll be out March 7th. Um, and so you can certainly be uh, paying attention at shadowproof.com and at the Project Censored page for more information about events around uh, both the film and Kevin's book. The book is titled Guilty of Journalism, The Political Case Against Julian Assange. It has a, a stellar foreword written by another intrepid independent journalist and filmmaker, Abby Martin. Again, Kevin's no stranger to uh, the Project Censored audience. He's been coming on the show for well, for a long time, but especially in the last year or so, Kevin's been coming on to give a lot of updates about the Assange case. He is clearly one of the most foremost experts uh, among a handful of people on the Assange case. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, has, has, has basically called him a go-to source on the matter. And uh, I'm just delighted to bring Kevin back onto the program today to talk more about this fourth coming book and why journalism really matters at the heart of the Assange case. Kevin Gostola, welcome back to the program. Hey, it's good to be with you again. Thanks so much, uh, Kevin. So let's just, uh, let's start in bec because this is a book and you wrote it. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about all the work you've done over the past plus decade, meaning how has that, how did that really kind of gear you toward this kind of book? You've been reading, you've been writing uh, a lot of uh, journalistic pieces now, th and this is a 300 page book. So that's kind of a different animal, but given that you've been writing about so many of these themes, it seems like it all really came together. And it's, 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 it's a very powerful book in, in ways that is even different than the several books about Assange that have come out recently. So tell, tell our listeners a little bit about maybe your process and your thoughts about writing the book. And then let's also maybe contrast it with some of the other things that are coming out around Assange right now, Kevin Gostola. Yeah, so I consider this to be the culmination of over a decade of reporting that I have done, uh, whether it was for uh, an earlier iteration or other formation. Uh, the It was called Fire Dog Lake. Uh, it was a progressive website that was kind of a mainstay, considered a part of the net roots with a grouping of other sites like Daily Coast. Uh, back in the uh, late 2000s, 2010s, I was brought on by editor-in-chief Jane Hampshire to be a columnist to cover civil liberties and national security issues. I took over for Marcy Wheeler, who left, mm -hmm. and I revamped the column and turned it into a space that not only covered civil liberties and national security, but also I brought in grassroots protests and brought in this grassroots energy to the column. And I would go to the hearings at Fort Meade where PFC Chelsea Manning was being put through a court martial. I did this from December 2011 all the way to August 2013 uh, when the sentencing verdict came and she received a 35 year sentence to Fort Leavenworth Military Prison. And then after that, I was introduced to whistleblowers like CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou, who endorsed my book. And I was introduced to NSA whistleblower Thomas Drake. I was able to uh, meet uh, people who were involved in whistleblower advocacy and were knowledgeable about the way the Espionage Act was used, not only against whistleblowers, but also um, as a way to go after and chill the ability of journalists to have confidential sources. Um, you know, and, uh, later on, I would connect with the wife of Jeffrey Sterling, um, a black CIA whistleblower. Um, I would go on to cover cases like Daniel Hale, who is a drone whistleblower currently held in very harsh conditions. And I write about him in the book because of the fact that I think those conditions are instructive for us understanding where Julian Assange could end up if he's brought to the United States and convicted. 
I was introduced to uh, Billy Winner Davis and uh, the family of reality winner. And I write about what she went through as another example of what could be the treatment that Assange faces if he's brought to the US. And so I think what's different, and you talk about these books and you compare them to different ones, we've got Niels Meltzer's book from Verso, which is considered the gold standard for uh, a book on the Assange case. And it's very thorough and it's the product of his work as the UN special rapporteur on torture. And he looked at each of the countries that are implicated in what Julian Assange has gone through, Sweden, uh, Britain, uh, Australia, and Ecuador in particular, as well as the United States. And he used international human rights law to assess the ways in which they had persecuted Assange. And it's a different book than what I put together because the book that I have formed is hyper-focused on the allegations that are in the indictment against Julian Assange. And it's very focused on what has happened in the United States since the publications of those disclosures that came from Chelsea Manning all the way up to, well, all the way up to the end of 2022 when we were getting uh, news uh, stories about the CIA spying on Julian Assange um, and uh, being involved in an espionage operation. This private contractor, UC Global in Spain, was involved. Um, and then another book that, that that is out there is you've got Stefania Marizzi's book, which is Secret Power, WikiLeaks, and Its Enemies. But where I am different from her book, is, it, it, we offer something different. She's offering a perspective from her collaboration with WikiLeaks. She was somebody who was given access to documents and worked on the war logs, the Afghan and Iraq war logs. She worked on the U.S. diplomatic cables. She's based in Italy. She focused on the country of Italy and revelations that were relevant to her home country. And uh, she also has pursued this really important work seeking uh, freedom of information uh, uh, sorry, she's filed freedom of information requests seeking records that relate to how Julian Assange was targeted, and she's fighting those in court. And this is work that I haven't done, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that um, that that I that I'm going to do that work. But uh, her book her book focuses on that journey, on pursuing that important endeavor, and then you know. Like I said, this book is very focused on giving people that guide. So in the event that there is a trial in the United States, we would have something that we could share with everyone to sound the alarm and tell people that this is what is happening to Julian Assange. Despite what you may hear in the courtroom, here is what you need to understand about Julian Assange's prosecution. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you pointed that out um, because it's important if people are really interested in this case, uh, they should be trying to read as much as they can from these different authors, these different perspectives, because, well, Kevin, as you know, and our listeners know, and we've been covering Julian Assange and uh, at Project Censored and WikiLeaks and various whistleblowers for years, because the corporate media don't cover uh, these stories. Or if they do, they have a very different spin. Uh, they leave a lot of information out. They write more hit pieces. And so it's really important for people to be able to follow the facts around these key issues because this isn't just about Assange or WikiLeaks. It's also about, uh, you know, the title of your book, Guilty of Journalism. I mean, this is what's at stake here. You know, you mentioned, you, I heard you say a word a minute ago that that um, uh, triggered a thought here, uh, sounding the alarm. Um, so uh, you've actually had a, a good Publishers Weekly review, I believe, uh, recently that, that uh, actually gave you high marks on the Assange book, which actually is... That's that's pretty wonderful. That that's a remarkable thing. However, like many of these kinds of reviews, they they always have some line or some aside or some quip. Um, and what what was the one line that um, what are the couple things that they had they had said uh, that you yeah, wanted? Yeah. So to uh, since we're talking about the book, why don't I just read uh, the review here, and then um, I'll, when I get to the section that deals with the quibble that Publishers <laughs> Weekly have, because I think they set up my book very well. 
They say journalist Gastola issues a stout defense of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in the searing polemic against the U.S. government's encroachment on the freedom of the press, which I think is a very good way to frame it. After Assange published more than a quarter million diplomatic cables leaked by former U.S. Army soldier Chelsea Manning, the CIA retaliated by labeling WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service, launching offensive counterintelligence campaigns, and hiring contractors to spy on Assange. Delving into the rise of an American security state after 9-11, the Obama administration's use of the 1917 Espionage Act to disrupt the flow of information from government sources to news reporters, and the fates of Edward Snowden, reality winner, and other whistleblowers, Gastola makes a convincing case that the American government has overreacted in the case of Assange. And then here's where they quibble with me. The argument is somewhat undermined, however, by the author's tendency to drift into alarmism. As when he suggests that the U.S. might eventually use the Espionage Act against private citizens who share critical views on social media. So... um. I'm not going to go into the weeds of how that surfaces in my book, but it does appear at the end of the conclusion. And I don't think they're recognizing the reality of press freedom in the United States by dismissing that so casually. Uh, What I outline is, first, I invite people to imagine a scenario in which a person could be on social media who is already known to be very critical of the U.S. government, and they themselves end up a target of you know an, a raid or an investigation under the Espionage Act. And what I had in my mind was the thought that, okay, there's not a lot of trust in media right now. You spend a lot of time on Project Censored digesting polls, looking at what people think about different institutions. Someone might not really know what individual journalists they want to turn to to give a document. Uh, They also probably don't want to go through proper channels if they've read any of the news because they could get crushed by their supervisor, whether it's in their chain of command. They probably don't want to go to Congress because the congressional committees are captured and they'll probably inform intelligence leaders that someone is a source and leaking this material. So what might they do? Maybe they know a family member or they have a friend that they don't think these agencies know about, and they pass it on and they say, could you just post this to your Facebook or could you post this to your Twitter and share it? I think we need to get this out. And maybe that person who gets it out is somebody, like I said, who is already been posting regularly, has a record of being critical of the US government. And I do believe that if they did that without having any background as a journalist without having a body of work as a professional, a media professional, they would likely be raided by the FBI because the FBI would want to know where they got that document. And that's what I outlined. So Kevin Gostola, is that alarmist or alarming? It's alarming. Um, (laughs) And I think you could call me an alarmist and I would embrace that label because we should be sounding the alarm about the fact that anybody could be guilty of journalism. Indeed. And uh, Noam Chomsky said about the book, it's essential reading for those who care about freedom of expression and elementary justice. We are speaking with journalist and author Kevin Gostola, talking about his forthcoming book, Guilty of Journalism, The Political Case Against Julian Assange, with a foreword by Abby Martin. So uh, in the time we have left, why don't we talk a little bit about a couple of the what you might see um, as the standout elements of, of your writing of the book, if you had to pick a, a, a couple of, of main takeaways or key things that you do in the book, um, what do you think that you would want to call attention to? And I, you and I had a conversation earlier, and I, w- I wanted to reiterate what we had off air. You have, a, a, a for example, you have wonderful epigraphs in, in, at the beginning of each chapter, and you you told me that those were all from people, musicians, artists, that that have been outspoken in their support or have, have, have supported the Assange case and case for freedom, which I thought was brilliant. And um, maybe there'll be a playlist uh, for that. But Kevin, go ahead. Talk to us a little bit about uh, a couple of the main things that you really hope people take away from this work. Yeah, definitely. So I, I have little touches so that I could make it personal. And like you said, uh, being such an avid music listener, I folded in 
some examples of many of the artists who have shown solidarity and supported Assange, and those are introducing, those help me introduce several chapters. But what I think is really the most important aspect to highlight about the book is the recognition that the Assange case doesn't begin with the indictment of Julian Assange. That in fact, many of the different aspects that you find in the indictment are resurfaced from the court martial against Chelsea Manning. And that makes sense, right? Because we already heard the other side. We heard military prosecutors talk to us about why they needed to punish and put in prison the source of the materials that had gave us access to this wealth of knowledge about how the US government functions globally and how it wages wars. And so you need to go back to that court martial and reflect on what were some of the things that were said there. And what about, how about some of the things in the indictment right now that are claimed? Did those claims do well during the court martial? Were they confirmed through the work of prosecutors or did they fail to corroborate? And I think the two most important points to make here with the brief amount of time that we have is, you notice that Julian Assange is accused of conspiracy to crack a password. Um, he's treated as a co-conspirator with Julian Assange, uh, sorry, with Chelsea Manning under the Espionage Act. And honestly, they never claimed that Julian Assange was working collaboratively with Chelsea Manning, or they never put that together during the court martial. In fact, they, I, I quote one of the prosecutors. Captain Joe Morrow, who said that Chelsea Manning was accountable for her own actions. I'm paraphrasing, but basically saying that 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 she's the one on an individual level who needed to be punished for what she had done. And they didn't say that she was put up to it by Julian Assange. So he's not guilty of um, whatever they're accusing. I mean, even if he had, though, one of the things we make clear in the book is that journalists solicit information all the time from their sources. They want to know who has access to material and who can give them stories. You know, whether it's uh, whether it's Julian Assange of WikiLeaks or to use somebody who's topical right now in our sphere or Seymour Hirsch, mm -hmm. a longtime reporter, they're going yeah. to lean on their sources to see what can you tell me so that I can put together a story that is in the public interest. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Kevin, there's other uh, one of the other hallmarks of the book uh, for me that that stands out that that is um, more of a list of things, and certainly actually one of the top ten stories in our latest book, uh, story number eight, uh, is is the story of how the CIA was plotting to kill and kidnap Assange, the Isakov story from Yahoo. Um, again, we know we know many things <laughs> that seem to just get swept under the rug or ignored. And there's a part at the end of the book that you list and categorize a lot of the major things that we've learned from Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, and the whistleblowers that that got information to him. And some of the some of the things on the list um, have have just been kind of. I mean, almost accepted. Or are there things that we, we've kind of the, the corporate media certainly likes to move on from them, right? They like to, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, that's just how it is, you know. But the list for me at the end is a really, it's a really great impact because it's look at the things that we know because of this, and and why is it that the major journalistic outlets didn't tell us these things? Why did we have to learn them from whistleblowers, and why did no one publish them except Assange? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I I, th I think you know one of the things that uh, people need to understand here about these cables, uh, these documents that were published, is that like even today you still have examples of people using this information in order to better understand the current world in which we live. The current world, not like to assess history and do research and 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 help people understand what happened during the era in which these documents were written but how these documents continue to have implications today and a, a great example are the cables related to Ukraine and Russia 
and NATO. Mm -hmm. And we won't go into the issues, but I just want to make the example that Branko Marcetic, who is a, a, a journalist with Jacobin Magazine, he did a story for an organization that is committed to pursuing peace, um, uh, avoiding the Cold War tensions between Russia and the United States. And he went through all of these cables mm -hmm. that came out about what was going on, what Europe thought about Ukraine, and he put it all together and he showed what the U.S. understanding was about how far NATO could go and what would get the NATO and the U.S. into trouble. And I just use that as an example. Now, also, I'll, I'll end with this. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the Iraq invasion. And it's very important mm -hmm. to just mention that that features in my book that I discussed the Iraq war logs and I also discussed the communications log that was uncovered when cables were posted to the internet by WikiLeaks at the end uh, 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 in August uh, 2011, towards the end of their work posting cables, people went through over 100,000 cables and found, I actually was the one that found it. I found a communications log. I put it in there and I do I do take credit. It's a lot of credit to take because in the end, that log played a huge role in the US withdrawing troops from Iraq. But I mean, the fact is I found it and then Glenn Greenwald hit it on Twitter and then he shared it and then it was being hit by a bunch of different people. And before you know it, uh, Democracy Now! was covering it. Democracy Now! actually already covered this raid that happened where um, there was a family that was basically massacred by this. And then the United States military tried to cover it up by bombing the raid. Like after people were massacred, they tried to cover it up by bombing the raid, I believe. And a UN official investigated this. And McClatchy, when they existed, had a reporter who covered this in real time. And Democracy Now! interviewed that reporter. So it was already known, this incident, but then we got this cable and it had a ripple effect and the Iraqi government said, you know what, we are not going to grant immunity to U.S. soldiers, so you won't be able to keep a residual uh, forces here. You won't have an occupation that you can continue past this date if you want immunity. And Barack Obama blinked and decided to pull out all forces from Iraq because he couldn't get immunity for any future war crimes by U.S. troops. And that was because of WikiLeaks. Yeah, e extraordinary in its significance historically and in the present, as you put it. The appendix is 30 WikiLeaks files the U.S. government doesn't want you to read. And uh, you broke it up with climate change and the environment, corporate power, human rights abuses, regime change foreign policy, and U.S. politics in general. Kevin Gastola, we're about out of time in this segment, but could you please tell people how to find and follow your very important work? And I know you're going to be doing a series of events and talks and tours. You're going to Europe. You're going to be doing things here in the States, and we certainly want to share those with our listeners. Uh, but please now at least tell people where they can go and, and follow and find your work. Yes, please go to the dissenter, D-I-S-S-E-N-T-E-R dot org. It's a free newsletter where you can subscribe and I will send updates to you about where I'm going to be and what events uh, that I'm doing uh, through that newsletter. Fantastic, Kevin. And of course, the Ithaca documentary is going to be screening around the United States from late February through March and April. Those were our previous guests, uh, uh, John Shipton and Gabe Shipton. Uh, father and brother of Julian Assange, uh, forces behind that important documentary. And we've just now been speaking again with independent journalist and author Kevin Gostola. His book, Guilty of Journalism, The Political Case Against Julian Assange, with a foreword by Abby Martin, illustrations by Mr. Fish. Contact your favorite local independent bookstore if you're interested in getting a copy, and please try not to get it from Amazon. Kevin, thanks so much for all the important work you do. Thanks for taking time to join us today. Thank you.